Hi KLR owners, I'm Eagle Mike and the guy behind the camera is Ian and he's a great guy, we've known each other for a few years. Today we're going to go over the 2022 KLR 650. We're going to demonstrate how to upgrade the balancer lever and add a torsion spring so that it tensions properly. I know that the system lasts a lot longer when it's, when it's properly tensioned. And you can see that the 2022 parts are the same as the Gen 2 parts. So here we go. First thing we're going to do is we're going to start the oil draining. And this guy has an aftermarket drain plug and it needs a, a hex driver. So we're going to use that to remove the drain plug. So Mike, can people still do this if they don't have a, a shop lift like this? Yes, you can do it by leaning the bike over to the right a little bit and not even draining the oil. And you could do it sitting um, on a milk crate. That's the classic KLR way. Okay. Um, I would advise having the bike sitting straight up and down though and draining the oil. The reason is when we get inside, you'll see there's some little washers in here. And sometimes they stick to the case. Sometimes the gear set comes with and the washers fall down. And if they fall down into the inner case, it's a little bit more agony to get them out. So I like to do it sitting straight up and down okay. just to keep life easier. So the best way is to have the bike totally straight up and down. You okay. bet. Okay, so we've got the oil draining and we're actually gonna remove the skid plate. This is an adventure model. And so it has these engine guards here and we might be able to do to remove the inner cover without removing the skid plate. I'm not sure. And we only have to take out four bolts so it's pretty easy to remove and that'll improve access. Now one thing that's different on the 2022 is there's actually a nut right here on the back of this bolt. So the, the heads of these bolts are eight millimeter and then you'll need a 10 millimeter wrench on the nuts on the two top on the bottom the nuts are welded to the frame, so that's no big deal. And I'm going to use um, a driver to save time. Now, as Mike's doing this, some people will have an aftermarket skid plate, so it might be a little different to remove that. Just keep that in mind. Yeah, and, and remember to keep track of all the little washers where they go. So for everyone watching, the reason we're removing the skid plate is just so we have better access to get the engine case off. Otherwise it would be in the way. Okay, now one thing that I've learned over the years is that a drain plug is either in or out. And you don't put it in without tightening it. So. The customer has asked me to put in one of my high strength, high temperature magnet, low profile magnetic drain plugs. The factory drain plug still on the 2022 sticks down below the frame. And every year somebody calls me and says my cases are cracked because I hit the drain plug on something. Rock, tree trunk, whatever. So my advice is to get a low profile one and I like to have the magnetic one so we can see if there's any uh, bearing deterioration. You'll see this steel stick to this. Okay, great. So now I don't have to worry about that. I know if it's in there, it's tight. Okay, great. So now there's a couple of differences on the 2022 that we're going to take a look at. Um, you'll notice that the counter shaft cover is different. Yeah, this is one of the first things I noticed. They changed this whole arrangement on the new KLRs. And one of the things, and just to, to, as an aside while we're working, uh, the, um, there's no longer a speedo cable going to the front wheel. And there's no longer a speedo drive, obviously, on the front wheel hub. So the speedo pickup is here, and the pickup is actually a special nut on the output shaft on top of the, the counter shaft sprocket. So you'll see that in just a minute. Why did they do that, Mike? They did that because they're going digital. 
on everything. Right. They've got a digital dash, and rather than, I guess, deciding to put a digital pickup on the fork and a magnet somewhere on the rotor, someplace right, like right. that, they did it right here. And it seems to be a bit of an add-on. You'll see the cage there when we get in there. Yeah, I can see it, yeah. And a lot of bikes have a sensor that's actually in the case and not externally added on like this. I understand why Kawasaki did it. I just haven't, I haven't seen another bike that was exactly this setup. It seems like an odd arrangement for a... I agree. I haven't seen another one like that. Now, one thing that we've got to watch for, I'm going to have to put my glasses on here, is on the top of this, there's um, a wire clip. And this is different. This is new on this bike. And it's good to keep the wires out of trouble. But I'm oh, gonna, yeah, that's true. Okay. I'm going to get a screwdriver so we can... So release your wire, wires there so you don't yank those wires out. So see, we just pop the clip loose right there. There's there's like three little places it can latch. Yeah, okay. And then we'll open that up a little bit and take our wires out of there. There's one, there's the other one. Now we can take this off and set it aside. Okay. Okay, so we've removed our counter shaft cover here, set it aside. And I'm gonna put our three bolts with that so I know what goes where. Learned that the hard way a couple of times. So now you can see our, this is our cage and here's our um, sp speedometer pickup right here. And it's located by those three bolts and then two dowel pins here and here that go into these holes on the engine case. And I'm just gonna lay that out of the way. So now we can see our neutral wire down here. We wanna pull that off of the, um, let me get this, this out of the way, there you go. Now you can see that better. Let me get a shot of this for people. Okay, yeah, there so it is. So we'll want to pull this off the little stud. Just pull it straight out. Okay. Okay, so now you can see it's off. And then another thing that they've changed, you see now they have a hard bracket here in addition to the oh, yeah. shape in I the case. That. So that helps keep the wires out of the counter. Because didn't they have spot. an issue on, on some of the earlier Gen 2s where the, the chain was eating up the wiring? Correct. Okay. Yeah, and if and if people aren't careful when they take off the cover, or or they take this off, you you've got to be careful and get be sure and get the wires, and you can see a little bit of the casting here, and you'll see more when we take this off. Okay. And by the way, this tool right here. Well, there's two tools here that I want to talk about that are super handy. Um, you can use a powered driver for taking apart and even putting back together. And I'll explain the putting back together part later. But this is really handy. I, I love these Bosch. They've been super reliable. They're not the cheapest, but they're super reliable. I use them for years and years. And this is a 5 16 nut driver, and the size is close enough to eight millimeter not to matter. And this one is magnetic, which is also handy oh, sometimes nice. yeah. when you don't want to drop. Yeah, okay. you don't want to drop stuff down in the case. This will right? just make things a lot faster, a lot easier. Right. Yeah. Mark Bakarich was the first guy to show up with a driver and do this at our tech days oh, yeah. in the early 2000s. Yeah, I remember Mark. Yeah. So we've been doing doohickeys since. Yeah, we should talk about that. I mean, when, when did we start doing this? I mean, I feel like I've known you for like 20 years. It's been and, close to that. And uh, we've been doing these doohickeys a tech day since since I was in high school on the Gen 1 bikes. Right. So we've been at it for a while, and uh, yeah, but it's great to be here. I never thought we'd be here with a fuel-injected KLR doing this. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the Kawasaki did a really good job with this bike as far as keeping the price where it is and yeah, making the I agree. improvements they did. So now we've, we've got the oil drain. We've got everything out of the way. We've got these wires loose so we can swing this um, case around when when it's time and then um, so I'm gonna t I'm gonna t actually I need to take the shift lever off next okay take the shifter off which I'm, is just one bolt right. and you have to take that that bolt all the way out right right yeah or else it won't and what's not gonna slide off and there's two tools that that work really well for this one of them is a ratcheting box wrench yeah. like this this yeah. is super cool and the other tool that I discovered a while back is this um, ratcheting handle 
ratchet and it looks like we'll have room to use that and this is so cool because first of all it works like a regular ratchet yeah but then if you turn this handle oh i've seen these that's so cool that's very handy yeah yeah it doesn't matter which way you turn the handle it still like goes that. the correct way unless you switch the uh you'll go back the other way that's cool so these are way way handy yeah so take off the shift lever which is pretty easy but just make sure that you guys take the bolt all the way out Otherwise, it's not going to pull off for you. Yeah, it gets pretty frustrating. I've had guys call me up, and they're pretty upset. Because it looks like if you just loosen it that you can pull the shifter off the, the shaft, but you can't. Right. There's actually a groove in the shaft yeah. to retain the bolt. So. A lot of people are complaining that the shifter's too short on these bikes, that they can't get their, their size 12 boots under it. So I, I know there's aftermarket longer shift levers and things like that, but yeah. then you have to watch that they don't hit the engine case. Yeah, we're going to um, have to, that, that was one of the problems that some of the reviewers said they yeah, they located it higher, but then it but was then hitting, it was hitting the case. Yeah. Now one thing, when you go to reinstall it, you see there's a tiny little dimple on the case right here. And that's your alignment mark for the stock shifter location. Oh, look at that. Yeah, it's hard to get on camera, but it... And a lot of people never knew that. I'll use a, a screwdriver to point it out. Yeah, 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 I can see it, yeah. So, if and even if you have an aftermarket, if you get it close to that, that's the average location. Okay. Because I've seen a few guys fight that before. Okay. So now we'll take off the, uh, the rest of the bolts. Yeah, saves a lot of time using that tool versus doing it by hand. Okay, so now I'm going to put these bolts right here. And these are different from the inner case bolts. These are um, 30 millimeters long, and they've been the same since 1987, okay? 1987 model. So now I'm actually going to need my my oil thing and pan just again. So right now we're taking. What do you call this case that we're taking off? I call it just call this the left left side outer cover. Outer. This is the outer cover case. Okay. Yeah. Some people call it the stator cover. Right. Because the stator the stator's in there, the right? Inside. Yeah. yeah. Now, it's a little bit hard to get off, and the reason is, and I'm gonna didn't really want to loosen it right now, but I will. Um, There's a O-ring on the balancer adjustment bolt and it fits the inside of this, the hole in the case right here really tight. And if I loosen that, usually the case comes off easier. Yeah, and I remember that. Okay. I wanted to leave it tight so we could see if the system was going to adjust it all when we took off the, the cover, but I didn't want to fight yeah, the yeah. cover while we're on So video. that's some resistance you're fighting is that O-ring or that in there. Yeah, thing. plus the magnet in the stator. The, the magnet in the stator. So yeah, I have to pull this a little bit, just pull it straight off. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to set this right back down here. And for now, I'm going to set this. Now, you can see that these these two gear sets came with the case. And here's the little washers I was talking about. Yeah, those can come off. Right. So this this gear set right here the washers usually stay on but not always and you can see they actually have some assembly lube on yeah, here yeah yeah and that helps the washer and the pin on this one is fixed and there's actually um, a limiting a torque limiting clutch in here that so it doesn't back drive okay. the starter um, so then this one you can see that the pin is not fixed and we want to always keep track of one washer on each side. See, there's a washer there. Yeah, yeah. And then there's, there's our needle bearings in there. Okay, so we'll keep track so of So why do we have parts. to take all these off to do this procedure, Mike? Just so they don't go rolling Just so they don't the fall off on accident. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. So here's our, our gasket. And um, since it, it, see it tore actually right there. So, and there's, there's Dell pins here too. But we're going to just take this gasket off because we'll replace it later. Yeah. Gaskets are, are cheap compared to the agony they cause right. you know, if you don't have the engine sealed up. So the next thing we want to do is extract this rotor bolt. And we'll need um, one special tool for this. This is a 19 millimeter socket. And then uh -huh. I have a special wrench that I make. And there's been 
several different versions of it and this is the current version right here we we um, make the handle and we make this and this can actually be flipped over if this side gets damaged it can be flipped over and you can oh, okay. use the other side so that's actually one reason we did it this way and this is lighter than the steel wrenches too so, so it's easier to ship so this is really the only special tool that we need for this whole job right um no we'll also need the rotor puller oh the puller okay so you need the holder and the puller okay right and th there was a time when we we had the forged uh made in the usa inch and a quarter wrenches yeah and we cut the sharp end of the handle off it's actually a bridge construction wrench and then there was a time I heated and bent the Chinese wrenches, but I think this is the overall thing. Yeah. It doesn't slide off as easily because it's captured. Yeah, you see it looks, two flats. looks much better. And it's not magnetic either, so this, uh, the magnets in the rotor can't okay. pull on it. So I'm going to rotate this out of the way, and then I'm going to get a piece of wire. I know there's a piece of wire here somewhere in a second. Say hello to our yeah. helper over here. Okay, so there's Thumper Bob. Thumper Bob. <laughs> and he's feeding the wire over the engine. And if you would snug that up on the passenger foot peg about right there, Bob, I'd appreciate it. So we're just hanging this out of the way and so that it's not causing any issues, okay? Okay, so now I'm gonna, I've got a 19 millimeter socket and I've got this resting on the foot peg bracket. And I'm going to get an extension and a breaker bar so we can, um, actually we'll have to put this on the bottom of the bread and we'll uh, extract the bolt. Go ahead. Okay, so now we've got our rotor holder wrench and I'm gonna rotate that up against the um, bottom of the foot peg there. Okay. And I'll have to do a little bit of holding when we get to it, not, not much. Okay, so there and so now I, I make sure it's aligned well and then I put a little pressure on it and that should make it stay. And I'm using a two foot long breaker bar. Yeah, let me show you. He's using a two foot breaker bar. To, there's quite a bit of torque on that. And I'm yeah. using gravity. Don't try to push up this. It's a lot easier if you can get on the downhill side. Yeah, yeah. Kind of lean on. Okay, so we got our rotor bolt loose. And let's see, I know we got a rotor puller. Oh. Our helper has the rotor puller. That's remember, I remember this. You know, I think I might still have this in my in toolbox. Stash. Yeah. yeah. So I always put a little bit of grease on this just so everything works better. Okay, grease that. And then we'll screw this through. Let's see, make sure it screws easily. This one feels like it might be tight. We'll see how it goes. So this threads in, and what's the purpose of this for people that don't? This screws against the end of the crankshaft and presses or pulls so when it presses against the end of the crankshaft, okay. it pulls, it pulls the, rotor the rotor out. Off. Now once in a while, now I make mine out of a not average material. I make mine out of a stronger material than most companies. And they last quite a bit. Once in a while, one of these is really, really, really stuck. And if it is, and you strip the threads on the puller, it's hard to get it out. But once you get it out, I have a special tool I made, I call the super puller. And you'll use these six bolts in here in the bowl to pull it off. Okay. okay? So there is a recovery way okay. if everything goes wrong. All right. So I'm going to rotate this around so that the handle will be on top of the um, foot peg. Whoop. Okay, so now we're putting the rotor, the holder above the foot peg. All right. So now you can see that I'm screwing it in and it screws against the end of the crankshaft and there and it came loose. Okay it didn't take a whole lot of force to do that. No, no. having a, a long breaker. Bar. But he's using a two-foot bar so. That makes a big difference. Okay so now the rotor's loose. And so one thing you can do is you can kind of use this as a handle now before we go any farther, you can take a look here. This is way different. See, these are yeah. triggers for the electronic ignition and fuel injection. Yeah, it does look different. And you'll notice, and I'm told... Different than the Gen 1 and 2 is what we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. So, one of the things is, you see there's a skip right here. And I'm told, I have never designed a fuel injection system, but I'm told this is this skipped 
thing right uh-huh. here is the trigger. Oh, okay. But the gen, the, this whole process, we're doing this on the Gen 3 for the video, but it's really similar on the Gen 1 and 2s. It's just slight differences here and The there. only difference, yeah, is, is the counter shaft cover. Yeah. And how to take it off. Right. And that little w- bolt holding the right. wiring bracket. But once That's you get in here, we're doing the same thing. Exactly. Okay. So what you want to keep track of is this little key. This clocks the rotor. And there's a, this is called a woodruff key. And there's, woodruff keys are half moon shaped yeah. rather than a square key. And there's a slot here. So it indexes it to the right point. Okay, yeah. yeah so. And I'm going to just set that on the magnet in the rotor right there. Now I'm going to pull these off. Okay. So this is basically we're there. So now you can see the doohickey. And the doohickey is technically what? Technically the balancer what? adjustment lever. Balancer adjustment lever. All right. This is the balancer chain system, not the cam chain system, as some people are saying on the internet. Right. Yeah, the cam chain you can see is right here. Yeah, but that's not, we're not doing anything to do with that. Right. You know? And when we get this secondary inner case off, left side inner case, you'll see more. And when we'll talk a little bit about how the whole balancer system works and where the wear points are and why it's important to do this. But one thing you can see is that, see the spring in back here <laughs> is pulling on this. It is pulling on the system right now, but you can tell there'd still be slack in the system because this fits so loose. Nothing. Yeah, yeah, there's not enough tension to, it's just not gonna tension it properly. So what's what happens when you don't have tension in the system over time? First, the rubber right here starts to wear. And then, and also the rubber here, and yeah. to a lesser degree on the other sprocket that we'll see in a moment. Yeah. And. When that happens, it creates more slack, and then it starts to wear on the case down here. Okay. And then there's a, even in Gen 2s, where the lever is less likely to break, I do have a couple of broken ones, but it's way less likely, the spring runs out of tension very, relatively quickly. Yeah, yeah. And when you get that wear, I actually had a couple of guys with ruined front sprockets. A guy shifted down to fourth. He had a a little under 11,000 miles on the bike, he shifted down to fourth and nailed it to go around a semi up at Apple Valley. And he stripped a bunch of the teeth off the sprocket. And I've got pictures of that. I've posted them places on the internet. And I actually gave those parts to Kawasaki about 10 years ago. Yeah. So um, now if if you only put 5,000 miles on the bike ever, probably don't need to upgrade but if you're going to keep the bike or if you want to keep the balancer system working properly and you don't want excessive wear then you'll want to do what we're doing here and as a a point of interest um, Wattman has over 185,000 miles on his engine original piston bore rings original balancer chain cam chain and original balancer weights and the normal wear place, the first place to wear, like I said, is the rubber on this weight. And there is a spec in the old manuals on for measuring the chain, but usually the chain is okay. Now, if, if you get it where it's super loose and it's flopping around, then you can ruin the chain, but most of the time the chain's okay. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the rest of the bolts off the left side inner case. And there's one bolt right here that's different. You'll see that this, blue paint is on it and sometimes people ask me you see this blue paint yeah yeah on here well that's that's like a checklist thing they're saying as soon as they paint that put they torque it they put a dot of paint on it and that tells them it's done for the next guy that comes along okay that's just like a completion mark and this one's like I say is a little shorter so why don't you have to take off this inner case Mike to remove the factory extension spring okay yeah some guys will go in there with a pair of pliers and twist it and find a yank it out you know once you get it unhooked over here you oh. can rotate this up and get it out but that's a lot of agony yeah yeah so it's easier just to take this off okay. that's the way I do it yeah let's see yep we'll have to bolts right here because of the crash bars they couldn't get the yeah I in see there. so yeah we left these crash bars on on the gen 3 
And some guys ask about putting Loctite on here, and that's and that's not a concern. No. I've never had them come out when any kind of reasonable care is done. The biggest right. mistake people make with those is they over tighten them, right? Right. Yeah. Because there's, there's not much torque on these little eight mil, these little bolts. Yeah, there is a difference between inch pounds and foot pounds. Yeah, twelve times different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I've actually had I but twenty people call me over the years. Now you'll notice it as I pull this out. I'm keeping pressure on this shaft. I don't want the shaft to come out. And you'll see there's nothing. Okay, we got our inner case off. And sometimes... So you don't want to pull this, this shaft out when you're pulling that case off. Right. Okay. Now this is actually beveled here compared to the old days. Yeah. And what's interesting is the old, the spring used to rub grooves in this. Oh, I see. Now the extension spring, and, and this is, we'll get into a little bit about the advantage of the torsion spring or the extension spring and you can see as this moves just a little bit it wouldn't take much and this would be completely out of tension you can see a little bit of space in the coils there but down at this end there's no space and there's there's maybe yeah 15 20 thousandths at this end and let of me course, close in on this and try to show people what we're talking about so this this is the factory spring right okay and look how you see there's really it's not really providing enough tension. And as the bike ages and the chain stretches, it's not gonna be able to tension the chain. At all. Right? right. So that's why we're, that's one of the reasons we're doing this upgrade. Would you say the sp on the Gen 3 and the Gen 2 bikes, the spring's probably more the important part of the upgrade than the actual lever itself? Yes. Okay. The, the, lever, the lever itself on the Gen 2s, there's very few of them that break. And yeah. usually they just crack a little bit. But the problem is, is when they crack, it, the broken part digs into the engine yeah. case and it won't adjust anymore. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there, there's a reason to do stuff right. So you could see I could just pull that off with my fingers. Yeah, he didn't even need a, a tool to get that off. Okay. So there's our spring, factory spring. And the way this works, so this is supposed to rotate this way. And yeah. you can see that takes the slack out yep, of the yep, chain. Yep. Okay, and down here at the bottom, I'll move this lever out of the way. But if, as this wears a bunch, on the older bikes especially, um, we'd see the chain cutting into the this boss for the threaded hole right here. And this, as this, see as this wears, and of course this wears and this wears, it, it rotates. And the way this, this system works is kind of interesting. They have this rubber on the sprockets and that's a noise factor control, yeah. noise control. The, t the side plates ride on the rubber. The, the rollers don't ride down in the gullet of the teeth here. So, and the way the single cylinder engine works is it fires, you know, it accelerates the crank. And if there's slack in the system, it fires and it's rotating this way, it'll yank hard right here and do that on the rubber. Yeah. And, and that causes wear right here. And another thing that's kind of interesting, and these go on here, of course. But, okay, so we have 18 teeth on the sprocket, right? We have 18 teeth on this sprocket. We have to have 18 teeth on all of them so that it stays, it runs at engine RPM. And the engine runs this way, so that means the weights run counter to the yeah. engine. Okay. So there's 70 links in the chain, though. So that means sometimes people call me with questions about why the marks on the chain don't line up. You can see there's some, some paint marks here on the chain, uh -huh. here and here. Those are the timing marks for these sprockets, like the timing mark right here and a timing mark right here. And so if it only moves 18 links every time the engine goes around, and this is 70, it lines up every 35 engine revolutions or every nine revolutions of the chain. I think that's right. So there you go. That's how the balancer system works. Yeah. So now we're going to take a little break. First thing we're going to do is scrape the old gasket off of here so we can be ready to put, start putting it back together with new gaskets. Okay. Ready? Yep. Okay. So Mike, what are we doing now here? So now we're going to drill what I call the anchor hole for the torsion spring. Okay. And on the the they changed this casting here in um, 2010, I believe, and now it has a radius right here, and it used to have more of a um, 
different shaped pocket. And we're going to drill this hole, and I want the drill bit to touch the casting. Let's see, I want it to, to pretty much touch the cast, casting right here. And we're going to call this alignment 6 o'clock. You know, 12 o'clock yeah, would be yeah. up here, 6 o'clock down here. And we want to drill the hole about 4 o'clock, 4.30, okay. 5 o'clock, right around in there, because this is a super low mile bike. And if again, you, we're drilling the hole because the spring has to have a, a retainer, right? It's, right? it's to retain the spring, okay. Because right. we're changing to a torsion spring. Okay. Right. So I'm gonna just drill it right there like that. There we go. And now I'm gonna go over to the machine and blow this off. Right. Okay. So okay, so we got the drill, or we got the hole drilled in the case for the spring. Now what, Mike? Now what? What I'm going to do is, and we we clean. There's there's marks on here, but there's no gasket. You know, there's nothing you. So can we scrape the gasket. We cleaned it from the gaskets. Yeah, you have to it. you have to scrape the gasket to have a clean surface. Yeah. Right, and I'm going to put a little bit of Permatex Number no. Two, non-hardening, uh, gasket maker on here just to tack it so that it'll okay. stay as I go and then what something important you want to take a look and be sure both these dowel pins are here they could be in the other in, in the inner case instead of right here yeah but I like to put them right here because this will help pull the gasket orient yeah okay so okay now, now you can see I've got just a little bit pretty thin coat and a few spots okay just enough to tack this in place so it doesn't flop around too bad now here we've got our inner case and what I always do is I always start it over the starter first. I see. Okay. Starter, and it has an O-ring up here, and it fits this bore really tight to seal the oil into the engine. And so it sometimes it can be pretty stuck up there. But I'll I'll just set it on there, and then I'll start it on the shaft down here. And again, while we're doing all of this stuff, we want to make sure that shaft doesn't pull out because there's a washer behind there, pretty thick. And if it falls down in the engine and then hits something. It can break stuff. We can do a separate video on um, recovering how to do that if it gets. So you can hear that snap in. Yeah. So, and this side goes up. Yeah. In just a little bit more. That looks no. It's in all the way. The the case has yeah, has a little a mismatch right there. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to put in all the bolts and torque those and I'm going to set up a tool for that. Okay. Yeah. So this is um, another Bosch tool that's really cool and the thing that I like about this for putting stuff back together is it has an adjustable clutch. Yeah. So I set this all the way down to one and that way I can be sure it's not going to over torque and then I can finish everything up with a torque wrench. Okay. So we're going to start off with our short bolt. Again we can see that there's two different bolts and the short one with the blue paint goes up here and it really doesn't matter for this what order you do them in and guys just so you notice what we're doing these bolts are going in just like not even snug they're just barely in um, because you don't want to over torque these at all they're gonna get a torque with the torque wrench but you really don't want to use a power tool uh, that's not appropriate and over tighten these things. So it's a very, very light torque that he's using. Let's see. These wobble drivers are pretty handy. You can tell that that clutch is barely, it's just yeah. barely touching. Okay, so now we're gonna get a torque wrench and set that up for 70 inch pounds and we'll torque mm -hmm. all of these. Remember you guys, 70 inch pounds, not foot pounds and not Newton meters. Okay. Now these are, and these are really handy. Uh, McMaster Car sells these torque wrenches. 
a lot of guys like Harbor Freight, and I've had mixed uh, results with Harbor Freight torque wrenches, yeah. and so I don't trust them anymore. Yep. If it's all you can afford, it's usually better than nothing, but, um, and, but this CDI torque wrench, they're sold by McMaster Car, made by the same company that makes Snap-on stuff. Yeah. And they're all calibrated from the factory. They're good stuff. Yeah, personally, I won't use the Harbor Freight torque wrenches myself, but I've just seen too many issues with them. Yeah, we had a couple of them literally just fall apart, and they, they hadn't been abused or anything at Tech Days. The, the, the guts of the ratcheting part just fell out, and um, I know that most of the time they're okay, but I don't want to be the guy that has a problem because of the torque wrench yeah. didn't work right. So right now we're just torquing the inner case that we took off. So what's next after this, Mike? Now we're gonna put the uh, torsion spring on and then the doohickey. And so that hole that we drilled, this leg of the torsion spring goes in there. Sometimes I have to use pliers to push it in because it pretty, fits pretty tight, but let's see if I can just, I got it started and I'll just try to push it in the rest of the way with a screwdriver. The blade on this is a little bit narrow, but there, nope. So what he's doing is getting the spring set in that little hole that we drilled. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Let now, me get a close up of this for people. Okay, so there's your spring. So now we're gonna push this lever down. And the reason we're gonna do this, if, if you put the, the uh, part on like this, you can see it looks like there's no adjustment, okay? But the right thing to do is to push this lever down here and then put this on the uh, shaft. And then the way that I like to do it is I will um, take the adjustment bolt and I'll push this over to take the slack out. And you'll notice that, th that my lever still has more adjustment left yeah, for sure. Than the factory one. The factory one was over halfway used, and this bike only has a few hundred miles on it. Yeah, yeah, this bike has 400 something miles on it. So now we have a ton of adjustment in a system, which is the way it should have been designed. And I'm just going to snug that up so it'll stay in place while I pull the spring around. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So I've got a separate video on installing this spring on YouTube that Wattman filmed years ago at a tech day. And the biggest thing we want to think about is pulling this spring around, following the arc of the spring, and then down into the slot. If we do all that, it's usually not too hard. What happens is sometimes guys will get a part way around and then they start pulling it straight down. Okay. So you want to follow the arc down as... And, and, yeah, there's quite I'm, a bit of tension on it. So I'm going to ro rotate my wrist around. See, it's, I'm not working too hard. And then I'm going to just hold it in place with a screwdriver like that. And you can see that it's just about into the slot. Pull it out just a little bit towards me at that point. And then just give it a little tweak. And there it is in the slot. Yeah, you didn't have to work very hard to do that. And you can see that it's sitting really nicely. Let me get a close shot in on this now. Okay, there you guys can see how it's supposed to look, all right? Yeah, if you, if you don't fight it, just think about pulling it around. And you'll notice one, one thing that's really important. You'll see that I kept this part right here on the outside of the, the profile of the lever. We want that bend, that last bend, just keep it on the outside of the lever, and then at the last minute, we just bring the hook in and put it in the slot. Okay. That makes life easier. So now what I'm going to do to make the install of the outer case easier is I'm going to just crack this loose half a turn, that's all. And you can see that the, the spring pulls on that just a little bit. And you could also see that that thing has about 120 degrees or so, maybe a little more, a little less, of rotation. and and that gives this thing a lot more travel than that factory lever with the factory spring. Yeah, for sure. 
Now this is captured on install. You can see it's wrapped yeah. around this. It can't yeah. go anywhere. It takes the slack out in the best possible way. The extension spring while the engine is running is constantly going like this, yeah. stretching and relaxing. And so the torsion spring has a number of advantages. So we've got all this done. The next thing we're gonna do is um, we'll double check our cases, make sure they're clean, and then we're going to put our, we can put our, um, we make sure the two washers are back here, make, make sure, because once in a while they stick to the big starter. Yep, here. okay, two washers. Make sure they're there. Let's put this on. Now let's put our thin washer on. And now we're going to put our key in. Now, if this is your first time, you might want to take a center punch and make a dimple on the side of this, maybe both sides. And what that does, that raises the material up around the dimple. And then you'll have to tap it into the slot and the the dimples make it stick in the slot. So it won't so fall out when you're trying to put it in. Out. Right. Now, I've done a couple of these before. Yeah, Mike doesn't need to do that, but so I've done actually <laughs> You've done a couple thousand. A couple thousand. Yeah. He's only done this a couple thousand times, so you know he's not that trustworthy. But I thought about um, doing one blindfolded. The only problem was it'd be if I dropped a bolt or a washer. Yeah. <laughs> but other than that, I'm pretty sure I could do it. Well, blindfolded. we'll do the blindfolded one another day, but. Well. So and then we'll um, we want the only thing that we want to be kind of dry is this taper on the inside oh, I see. Okay. of the rotor. And what's that you're holding? The rotor, right? Okay. Yeah. It acts as a flywheel and it's the magnetic part of the stator that generates electricity. So now the, the big time trick that makes life a lot easier, first I know that the slot here is about, this is pretty close aligned with the key, and you'll see that I'm turning this as I... I see that, yeah, so he's, ta he's taking his fingers and turning that that gear behind there as he wiggles this on. Yep. Okay. Well, this one's a little bit stubborn. There we go. See, there we go. And one thing you can do is you can see this one, I can pull it out a tiny bit and wiggle it and I can feel that it's stuck on the key. Yeah, yeah. Another thing that some guys don't always recognize is there's a gap right here. Between, they think that the threads should be all the way against the end of the crankshaft. Oh, yeah, yeah. And no, there's there's about a quarter inch in there. Okay. And that's normal. All right. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is um, we're going to actually you can see a little grease in there from the assembly. That's not a big deal. Um, we're going to put a rotor bolt in there and we're going to torque it up. Okay. And let's... Rolling. Okay, so here we're going to... So now we're putting on the new rotor bolt. And this is a new bolt, by the way. Right, it's supposed to be one time use. Yeah, you can't reuse the bolt, so. Now on the 600s, the specified torque was 85 foot pounds. On the Gen 1 650, the specified torque was 130 foot pounds. And on the Gen 2, they went up to 144. And for the Gen 3, they went to 145 foot pounds. Okay. Realistically, I don't think it's going to be a big difference between 130 and 145. No. no. Now, one thing you do want to do is you don't want to use a torque wrench that stops at 150 and think it's going to be accurate at Because it's too close to the top end of its range. Right. right? Yeah. yeah, good practice is to not use the bottom or top 10% of a torque wrench. Yeah. So you want to get one, you want to get a long one because it's 145 foot-pounds, and you want to get one that goes up to like 250. And, and what, if, what if people don't have that? Well, then you're just, you're trying to get, you know, it's, it's tough, right? Because you're trying to get close to that 140, right. 130. Um, so if you had a two foot bar at that point, you want to put 65 pounds or 70, almost 75 pounds of pressure on, on the two, two foot, foot bar. bar. Yeah. So that's, that's a fair bit. It's you know? pretty torquey. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a good quality bolt. Um, it's a special bolt. It's it's rolled threads, which are stronger than cut threads. Yeah. And I hardness tested a few of them, and the material they use is quite strong. Okay. So it's good stuff. Gen 1 and 2, the traditional way is you go to 85, 
you bust it loose and that what that's supposed to do is seat it so everything is square and now another thing that you want to do that's super super important no matter what year you're doing it this on is you want to make sure this will still turn and in fact I'm going to do something here I'm just going to snug this up so we still yeah we're still on there okay Okay, and let's make sure this turns. Now if it doesn't turn after you put some kind of good decent torque, even if it's only 20 foot pounds on there, it's time to stop and pull it off because that means probably you either got the washers in the wrong place or you didn't get the key in the slot. Okay. So so before you fully torque it, make sure that that, that gear still can right. spin back there. Okay. And it'll only turn clockwise. clockwise. It will not yeah. turn counterclockwise. That's the one way clutch. That's how the starter works. Okay, so there's our 85. So 85, then break it loose and then go to your final torque. Okay. Right, and I'm not using the torque wrench to break stuff loose because that's considered bad shop practice. Yeah. You know, you want to yeah. save your torque wrench for when you got to torque stuff. You don't want to ruin it. Okay, so now we got this on the bottom. So we just get that loose enough there, just a little bit. Okay. I'm going to back this up just a little bit so we can get the... Actually, I can't do that. We'll have to turn it around the other way. Get the uh, wrench on there. And sometimes people have said you don't want to turn the engine backwards. Well, that's because when these gears are in there, they'll drive the starter backwards. Yeah. Really, the little bit that we're doing and as slow as we're doing it really wouldn't make a difference. But yeah, yeah. I understand it. Why people say that. Okay, so now we'll come down on there again. So we're getting ready to do the final torque of the rotor bolt. And you'll notice again I'm trying to use gravity to yeah. make, make life a little better. And Still turning? Yeah, make sure that gear is still turning. And there's 140. 145. You went for the full money. Okay. So now all the hard stuff is done. So the next thing we're going to do, and there's a little bit of paying attention here, and you'll notice, let's see, right here, I left that one bolt out because that's where the wires are going to go. Okay. Under that wire guard. Yeah. And so you got to pay attention right now. Um, so this can be installed wrong briefly, but the right way to do it, you can see if you put it in wrong, like this, it's all, it's it doesn't really engage the starter yeah. correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the right way to do it is this, because then you'll get full engagement on the starter back here on the back. Now. The easiest way to do this other gear cluster is to put the pin in, and that's another reason I took it apart because it, it's a lot easier to put it back together now. And let's put these two needle bearings on there gently, and now we'll put this gear on there, and probably, see, it doesn't go all the way. So the trick is we're going to turn this big starter gear just a little bit and then it goes right in. And then here, there's our last washer. So okay. again, you want to be sure that there's one on each place. If You don't want two because if you mess up and get two of them, one extra where it wouldn't, sometimes it's tight enough clearance that it'll bind things up. Yeah. Sometimes dowel pins have a little resistance, you know. Yeah. Okay. And we'll put a little bit of our Good old Permatex number two on there. Again, we don't want the gasket to flop around and make life hard. This is just enough to stick the gasket to hold it in place. Yeah. Some guys put RTV on there, and you can, but I, I it's not needed. And sometimes there's been cases 
over the years where it can plug up oil passages if you use too much you know so use a little finesse now Kawasaki says to put some gasket sealer in this area or on this case right here oh I see and I, I usually don't bother but since we're doing a video go by the book mm -hmm. I'm gonna do it because see there's a cup these the, the um, the connectors here for the stator, it's a big squishy rubber grommet. And let's, okay, so now we've got all this stuff in place and I'm gonna unhook my magic wire and I rotate this around and I'm gonna keep my fingers in the way a little bit so that the magnet doesn't just pull it chunk in. And you gotta use a little finesse. And there we are. Okay. So now we're going to use our same drive tool to put in all of our bolts. And I think that I will go ahead and do that electrical bolt last, the wire clamp bolt like we did before. Yeah. So all these bolts right here are the same length, right? Yes. Yeah. They're all uh, six millimeter thread. And just a quick note, a lot of guys might call this an eight millimeter bolt. No. It's, it's a six you measure it by the bolt. thread, right? By yeah. the thread. Not, not the, what you drive not by it with. The head. Yeah. yeah, because on the Kawasaki, there's going to be some of these that are 10 millimeter head and some are eight. Yeah. And so calling it a, a 10 millimeter bolt, it just That would be bad because then if you looked at a torque value for something like that, it would be way too high. It's, it's actually only a six millimeter bolt. Yeah. Right. And I do have service manuals in stock. For this I'll put them on the website um, they're pretty affordable actually Kawasaki's priced them at $64.95 and I yeah. think that's a pretty screaming deal for the knowledge you get so in this video down below in this video there'll be links to the service manual to Mike's web page to other doohickey videos and other KLR videos so all the resources will be down below in the description of this video okay so there's our spun in bolts Now we'll do our torquing. Does it matter what order you do this? No. No? Okay. We're not trying to create a seal yeah. in between pet chambers. We're just sealing the outside. So, And this casting is, as far as structural, you know, it's pretty malleable. It, it's it's going to conform. So we'll just go around and make sure we got all the way around. Now you'll also want this one time, you can get at the doohickey bolt. The actual doohickey tension and, bolt. Yeah. yeah, it's the clamping bolt, and we'll torque that up. Okay. And then we'll put the uh, little rubber cover on there. And we're almost done. Okay, okay so, action. So we've got this cover on, and it's torqued, and we still haven't put our our clamping bolt in yet because we're going to put our wires in the group in the groove and you can see I got one in there now and then I'm going to get the other one in there and you can see impressions you know in the yeah wire cover about where it's supposed to fit and then we'll put re we'll reach down here and you can see one one thing let's see if we can get in here I don't know if you can see in here um, See, this is protected from the counter shaft sprocket. There's a groove in the case right there. I see, the yeah, you can wire. see it on camera. Yeah. So that's a good detail. Make sure you don't screw this part up, guys, because you don't want to chew your wiring up with your sprocket. Okay. Or your chain. And if you, you know, when you're taking it apart, you can take a photo of it before you start taking it apart if you need to reference it too, so. Right. That's a good point. That's a beauty of cell phones. And now, now we'll put our um, bolt back on here with our. And that bolt, yeah, it's a, just a wire retainer thing for that. So see that'll keep the bolts, the wires protected there on the stator. Okay, so we're just about done. So we've got to have, let's see, we'll have to find one, there's one dowel pin that went for a hike. We've got a dowel pin here that goes in this hole, we'll find the other one here, and then we'll put everything back together. I don't want to edit any of this out but anyway oh, yeah. the, and these are what the famous dowel pins are that we keep talking about yeah so they goes in the hole down here 
Okay, yeah, they can see that, okay. And while we're here, since this one has had a little bit of travel, we'll just wipe the dirt. That was Jesse's grease, not mine, Jesse, if you're watching. <laughs> That's from when he wrote it. He told me not to get it dirty or rally it around too much, so. I only took it up to 80 in the dirt. So we'll find the holes there. And one of the things I noticed, let's see, come on, get on there. there yeah, this go. is one thing different about the Gen 3. So if you're looking at this and you have a Gen 2 or Gen 1, you're going to be like, what the heck is this? This is their new speedometer pickup on the Gen 3. And one thing I just noticed here when we took it apart is see there's another channel right here for this wire. Yeah. So we want to be sure and get that in the right place. Yeah. So now we got our counter shaft cover. We got our three magic bolts. So again, we're going to line this up with our little dingleberry on the case, kind of close there, and we'll get this. Is dingleberry bolt. the technical term? Yeah. <laughs> Looks almost like a small piece of weld splatter or something like that. I flipped this over. So he's just tightening the shifter here. Don't forget to do that. Yeah. Don't, again, these are small bolts. Don't over tighten these things. I got to get one of those ratchets. Yeah, these are great for the um, valve cover bolts oh, yeah. and the cam cover bolts. Or uh, cam cover bolts and the um, cam bearing bolts. I think we should put the Oops. shifter on in a crazy position so that when Jesse tries to ride it, that he can't shift. <laughs> That'd be more fun, he bought. And we'll just finish it up this way. Okay, so now we're ready to put our counter shaft cover on. We got all our wires routed properly. We will have to get them back in this yeah. in this uh, thing as we go get on there. Um, let's see, they're both right there. I think we'll do this after we get it bolted on. So we'll get that lined up with the holes and the long bolt. There is one long bolt and two shorter ones. We'll put the long bolt up on top. And you don't have to over tighten these. These these bolts are not structural. Um, okay. The last thing we have to do is to put the oil in on the other side. Oh, you want to put oil in the bike? Might oh. be useful. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> so, uh, and then your ladies and gentlemen, KLR owners of the world, there you are. There's your doohickey on the uh, 2022 KLR, and you can see that it's just the same as all the rest of them. Thank you so much, Mike, and uh, stay tuned for more videos uh, with Mike and featuring the new KLR. Thanks, Ian.